Turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. We'll start at verse 1 in a moment, 2 Kings chapter 6. And we'll be starting at verse 1. While you're turning to 2 Kings chapter 6, I want to take a moment to say thank you for having me up, having my wife up with me. I always like traveling with her and tolerating my grandkids, which I just love having them with me also. I've enjoyed being with you, getting to know some of you better. We have attended from time to time, and I have spoke here before, but we never got to spend this much time together and having supper together and talking about your various interests, of course, is a delight. And getting a feel for how Wayne and Linda fit in here, which was a, a definite delight, you know. I don't know if hand and glove would be the appropriate analogy, but from where I'm standing, it looks like a really good fit. And then all of you seem to get along. I hadn't heard any griping, whining, complaining, mumbling, moaning. Nobody brought up anything about that unless it was politics, but I guess after Sunday night's lesson, you're probably kind of afraid to whine or complain, right? No, it is all great. It's great to know that there are other congregations out there that, that have that. We use the term church family a lot because we're, we're one and we're supposed to be one and we're all in that same community. And it's nice to see it other places because I think we all know not every congregation has the love that, that you have here. And I've learned a few names. And I promise you by the next time I'm up to visit at your next meeting, I'll forget most of them. But you tolerate me and I'll, I'll be happy. I, we'll, we'll just rekindle and we'll work from there. Thanks again on Sharon's behalf. She's that grateful I am. And of course, Matt has been with me. Three? Yeah. She's loved it. Isn't it great to have grandkids that want to go to church with you? I'm like, that rocks. And then we got Archer tonight. And if you give him a chance, he will talk. He's smiling, nodding his head right now. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 6. Let me read verse 1 through 7. This is our text for the night, and you may want to put your ribbon there, because we will go some other places. The sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. Therefore, he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand, and he took it. Now, what I'm going to tell you, and if you want, be turning over to John chapter 10 for a moment. What I'm going to tell you is that this passage is your life. This passage, if you can learn to read between the lines, gives you a blueprint for how to advance your spiritual journey further to those places that I trust you desire to go. I mean, many of you have been here every night, every service, which is to be complimented. That's, that says to me, either you have got nothing else to do anywhere or you are really interested in the spiritual. And so what this passage does, if you can read between the lines, is it carries us toward what John 10.10 10 would say, where he said, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Christ was here so that you and I can have an abundant life. Now, I, I need to clarify because of so much nonsense in the religious world now. He is not talking that he came and went to Calvary so you can have all the money you want or so you can have the career that you want or you can have the things that you want. When he's talking about that abundant life, he is talking about that spirituality. And we've talked about that a lot this week and we're going to weave it in again also. But he's talking about those who want to seek the face of God. We read that term in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen last night. You're talking about those people who want to take delight in respecting God and keeping His commandments because they know that's what moves them forward on the spiritual journey. They understand that is their whole purpose and, and reason for existing. That's who He's talking to. That's the abundance He's talking about. Now, if you do happen to have some money, that's fine. If you happen to get the career you want, that's an extra blessing. Enjoy that. If you have some things, that's fine also. And incidentally, we Americans are generally rated the top 10% of the world's wealth. If you live in America and you are on minimum wage, 90% of the world says, I want to live at your house. I wish I had your opportunities. I wish I had your resources. So we're all really, really wealthy people on a global scale. And that's okay. Just understand that that's not what John 10.10 10 is talking about. John 10.10 10 is talking about your spirituality. And so turn over to John 17. I'm going to read verse 21 in just a moment. If what I've just said resonates with you, 
then what I'm going to share with you out of 2 Kings 6 is let's call it a vision for your future, a plan for your future as we unpack that. Because what we are doing, what we are aiming at in the perfecting of holiness, as we mentioned briefly last night, is the becoming one with God in Christ. Now, I know that might sound a little, woo, but it's not. Look at John 17 and verse 21. Christ is praying, right? And he says that they all may be one. Let me read that again. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This is the kind of oneness we're talking about, that unity with God. And I don't know how else to explain it, but I'm going to be really, really brief. Husband and wife, when they get married, they become what? Okay. When we get right with God, we become one. Now, that's all the theology I got on that. <laughs> And I'll let you take it further. But that, that is our goal, is to be one with God. Now, if you got that, then let's go back. And I got my ribbon there to 2 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to take verse 1 and verse 2, verse 3. And then we're going to take verse 4 and 5 together and verse 6 and 7 together. And you don't get the floating axe head until almost the very end. I didn't put the text together. That's just the way it unfolds. So he said, the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, see now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. They had a problem. Their problem was they were outgrowing where they were. It was time to move on. They had gotten uncomfortable. Things had gotten a little too tight, a little too compacted, and it was time to go looking for another place to live. They were going to have to make some changes in order to take care of, take hold of a, a more comfortable future, a better future, a more productive future. They were going to have to make some changes and it wasn't necessarily going to all be easy. They were going to have to work. They were going to have to plan. There were going to be some things they would have to leave behind as they went and built their new place. But this is the way life works. We have to be willing to change if we're going to grow. And we have to be willing to recognize when it's time to change if we're going to grow. And I'm afraid that happens a little bit slower because, uh, well, let's just use the example of life. A one-year-old is one-year-old for how long? One year, right? Uh, and then all of a sudden he's a two-year-old or she's a two-year-old. And, and the change is slow, it's slow but they, they're, they're nine for a while and then it's time to move on to ten. And then they become a teenager and then they become in their 20s, you know. And, and it's a progress. But sometimes kids kind of get stuck, right? And there we say they're immature for their age. And they get, they get anchored into a spot because sometimes growing scary. The scariest transition in my childhood was when I got out of the sixth grade and I had to go to the junior high. And I was like, no. Mama said, yes. But they do like six classes a day and you have different teachers and there's kids I don't know. I don't want to go. You see, And that happens to us. We are in our spiritual growth. We say, I want to be a better Christian today than I was yesterday. That is a great idea. And we move a little along and we move a little along. And then we get to a place and all of a sudden I'm sixth grade going to seventh grade or ninth grade going to tenth grade. At least that's how we did it back in the 70s. And, and it, those are big jumps. I don't know I want to do that. Can't I just stay here forever? And then we become, you know, like in college and we're the perpetual college kid who's always getting degrees but never graduating and going to work. We can't do that. That's not right. At some point, it's time to move on and make some changes. And if those changes hurt, so be it. That's the way life works. Sometimes it hurts. But if you have the courage and the trust in God, and you can see that this is His will for us to develop and mature so that we can come, come men and women who are able to handle the meat of God's Word, then growing and going, you know, I think it's time for me to take another step. I don't want you to take too many at once. I think that's counterproductive. But I don't want you to stay in the same place forever also. Just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. And you keep doing it, you keep doing it. Eventually, you'll be getting older and maybe a little grayer. Uh, and of course, there's the one joke where people used to say to the young preacher, you're going to be pretty good when you get older. And later on, they started saying, I bet you were good when you were young. But now there's a few of them that get up there and, and folks go, man, I wish I knew. Let me toss out a couple of names respectfully. These men are no longer with us. I wish I knew everything Loyal Blasting Game knew. I wish I understood everything Ed Dye knew. But they didn't do that in a night, in a single reading. They did that in a career. 
moving, 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 keep stepping forward, never stopping until health reeled them in so much. And the last time I saw Brother Blassingham was at Cabot. And remember, he couldn't continue speaking, standing up, sat down in a chair because his mind was still sharp as ever and continued the lesson talking about the history of the church and more history than I think David or either one could even try to recall. Wow. How did the Lord do that? One step at a time. One step at a time. It's time for me to move on and take another step now. Time for me to learn just a little bit more now. So what we do is just as the prophets of old did, if we're going to be Bible-based, we're going to be aware of where we're at, how we fit where we're at, and when it's time to make some changes to grow. And I'm talking about our spiritual growth. That's what I really want you to focus on. So they said, verse 2, Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Now, there's two or three things there I think we get. They've got to look for advice, and I think that's great to do. But I, I want to look at this part where he said, every man take a beam from there. They believed in sharing the work. They believed in everybody doing what everybody could do. And that's a wonderful idea because one of the things we have going on so much now, it seems like, is everybody else is supposed to do the work. We even have a thing in the business world, and I forget the technical name, but it's the 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule is really pretty accurate. What the 80-20 rule says is that 20% of your people give you 80% of your results. Now, if you'll read John Maxwell's account on that, and he really breaks the 80-20 rule way down in one of his books, then you can get a lot more detail. I'm going to keep it simple right now. But anytime you have a group of 10 people, what that means is that two of them are doing 80% of the work. The other 80, other 80, excuse me, are only contributing 20% of the work. You ever see an office that works that way or another place that works that way? Now, if you take a congregation of 100 people, then what that means, and this still stays simple math, is that about 20% of the members, 20 of them, are doing about 80% of the stuff that needs to be done. The other 80 are there. They're sitting on a pew Sunday morning. That's okay, but they're not contributing much more beyond that. Now, you're going to have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis because I know some people have some health limits and can't do, and some need to be trained to do more, but usually you have 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. And so I wonder if the elders would do this, and I'm not advocating it, and I'm not going to do it back home either. But what if we took every member's name and put their name at the top of a sheet of paper, and then we listed what they do? Literally. How many items would be under your name? Attendance, that's good. That's a step in the right direction, amen? And then maybe, maybe some contribution. Okay, that's a step in the right direction. Some people don't even sing. Some people don't pray. And, of course, somebody's got to sit and listen during the teaching, so that will get you another star. And that's everything your congregation does, right? <laughs> right, no. Yeah, see? So it's the 80-20 rule. These guys didn't believe in the 80-20 rule. They said every man's going to carry a beam. Now, everybody has different talents. That would be Matthew 25, 14, beginning. Everybody has different talents. We're going to respect those talents. There are some people that try to lead a song, and we go, thank you. We'll be in contact. <laughs> And there are other people that are very, very talented at those things, you know. Speaking's a little bit different because most speakers, their first efforts, plural, were not impressive. The very first effort I ever made was a brief Wednesday night talk for about five minutes and my fiance at the time, she wanted to crawl under the pew. Now, we were married at that time. I've got my time schedule off, but it was ugly. Uh, and I'll tell one on a friend because he tells it on himself, Harold Hancock. After he preached his first sermon, his father-in-law said, keep your day job. <laughs> Harold Hancock is one of the respected preachers in the circle I run, and he is an impressive, very good speaker. Now, he's reaching his retirement years now, but you don't get that just by sitting back and doing nothing. It's the 80-20 rule. And if we're going to move into that area, as I called it last night, the bullseye, where you know this is why I exist, this is my purpose for being here, is to fear God and keep His commandments, or as Christ prayed, to learn to become one with God and, and Christ, to, do, to have unity, then I know I'm going to have to put some work in it. And one of the biggest troubles we're facing in America right now is almost nobody wants to work. We have a plague that's worse than COVID. It's the plague of entitlement. It's the plague of laziness. I just want the government to give me my check, provide my home, pay my utilities, be sure I have a PS4 or an Xbox so I can sit around and play video games all day long and not have to do anything. That's eating our society up. 
What happened to us at 2 Thessalonians 3.10? I know I can quote the verse right. If a man won't work, oh my, there's you some social program, isn't it? How about Galatians 6.5 where he says each one should carry his own load? Now we do bear one another's burdens, but we also carry our own load. Over there in Galatians 6, I actually have two different Greek words used. One talks about helping another person when they are just overwhelmed and cannot carry it. And the other word suggests your own reasonable load. And that's what we do. We carry our own load. Each man carries his own beam. And when a congregation works together like that, then you get the more joyful experience, like what I think I have observed here this week. So now I'm down to verse 3. Then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. That is genius right there. That is absolute total genius because you got to remember who Elisha was. Elisha was, can I say it this way? Elijah's understudy. And he got to see Elijah retire in the fiery chariot. But his request before he retired in the fiery chariot was, I want a double portion of the spirit and Elijah said, basically, I can't guarantee it, but if you see me when I leave, so on and so forth. And so Elijah's gone. He picks up the mantle and he takes it and he hits the water and the water splits. And Elisha apparently got the double portion. Now, this is, ingen this is genius because Jeremiah 10, 23, and I think you can quote it if I get you started. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. And you always got to put 17, 9 with that. Jeremiah 17, 9, where he says, The heart is decept deceitfully wicked. Whoa. So you don't want your own judgment. So here, these men have a prophet who has a double portion of the spirit. These are prophets, spiritually minded men. Who do you want to go with you? Oh, we don't need that old man. He's not up with the times. He doesn't understand anything. No, that would be ignorance, wouldn't it? That would be youthful pride. They understood who Elisha was. They understood what Elisha possessed. They understood the benefit to their own spirituality. They honored his, his experience, his position, and they wanted him with them. And that's exactly what you and I need, is we need men of God and women of God in our lives. Now, we're going to start with the Word of God. And we'll use Matthew 4, 4 again. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And now I get to jump over to my little read the book thing for a second, because that's where you get to learn the Word of God. You get some good support here as we do preaching and teaching, but I'm almost certain that after you left, you looked at somebody and said, now what did he say about... And, and, and you know, your memory's about as long as mine. None of us have a real long memory. That's okay, that's not bad. But if you're really going to take the Word of God with you, you've got to know it. You've got to know the book. You have to be reading it. You can't trust your wife to read it, your kids to read it, or your, your somebody else to read it. You've got to know the book. One-on-one, -on -one, up close, and personal. Because Elisha's not here to walk with us and live with us like he did with them. And so they looked for somebody who knew, had wisdom and understanding. For you and I, carry it all the time. How many, how many of you have this? I've turned mine off, I hope. <laughs> how many Bibles you got on yours? I've got a ton. I, got, I have more Bibles on my Bible app than I'll ever read in the rest of my life. I like the audible ones, incidentally. That's how I do my daily Bible reading. And, and I'm going to tell you why. They say those Bible names. And I can't tell you how many times I listen to them say those Bible names and go, you've got to be kidding. That's how you say that? They're not from Arkansas, are they? There is a variation in the way you can say the Bible names, but... Hearing it and reading it with your eyes, I just like that, that little bit of technique. So anyway, they wanted God to go with them. They wanted Elisha to go with them. We want God to go with us. God wants to go with us also, incidentally. It's not that we've got to overcome his reluctance. It's that we need to humble ourselves, know our place in relationship with God. And then as James 4, 8 would say, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a mutual thing. So God's not trying to keep all of this away from you. But we do have to spend some time. Seeking God, seeking understanding, or to use Second Chronicles 7.14 terminology, seeking the face of God. That's what it's all about, seeking His face. Let me add one other thing to that, and then I'll move on to, to verse 4 and 5. When I talk about seeking the face of God being the very center of the bullseye, I want you to understand that there's a whole lot of other stuff that is going to flow out of that. And, and it's going to be your life depending on where you're at in your stage of life and the responsibilities you have and the opportunities you have. There's going to be a lot of things that flow out of that. But at the core 
of your being is always going to be, I'm seeking the face of God. I'm here to revere Him, reverence Him, fear Him, and keep His commandments. And then if we do that, then all of this other stuff is going to follow, flow out of our life. So Galatians 6.10, do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. Well, if I have the core right, how am I going to treat other people? It's an automatic outflow. And it, it involves us in all of, of society. So down to verse 4 and 5. So he went with them. They came to the Jordan to cut down trees. But as he was cutting down trees, the iron axe fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, Master, for it is borrowed. So, so they're making changes. They're, they're going to a new territory. They're setting up a new place to live. It was probably pretty rustic. And, and there's no guarantee. No guarantee that everything's going to go smooth. Uh, this is where us modern Americans start getting a little hung up. Well, you know, I, I, I want to I learn to speak in public, but I need a guarantee that no one will laugh at me. Well, I've been doing this since I was 25, and I still don't have that guarantee. And now and then I butcher a word so bad, I still get laughed at. And back home, they do it right there, right in my face. That's all right. That means they're listening. That's good stuff, you know. I, I, want, I want to teach class, you know. I want to be in the kids' class, and, and I want to guarantee that it's going to be quick and easy, and I'm going to be fabulous with the kids. No, there's no guarantee. I want to walk the straight and narrow, but I want to guarantee that there's going to be no trouble and nobody's going to harass me. Well, you can forget that one because Acts 14, 22 says we enter the kingdom through many tribulations. There's no guarantee. The prophets of old, the people that we're supposed to learn from, they were written for our benefit. The people we're supposed to learn from said, we need to go. It's time to grow. It's time to move. And we're going to plan and we're going to work and we're going to sweat and we're going to labor. And, and maybe it won't all go smooth. And it didn't. But they didn't wait for an angel to come down from heaven and hand them a guarantee with God's insignia on it. They said, we're going to go. And that is such a simple concept. There was even a country song, probably many more years than I remember now, that sang, life is a dance. Remember? You learn as you go. And isn't that the truth? Life, you learn it as you go. You move forward, you have some victories, you have some woohoo moments, and then sometimes you fall on your face. And you say, I ain't going to do that again. That wasn't any fun. And you get back up and you keep moving forward and you keep working and developing. So they took their axe and they started cutting down trees. Now, I've never really cut down a tree with an axe. I've watched some of those lumberjacks do it on TV many years ago in their competition. And those guys are good, right? You got to have the right tools and you have to know your equipment. Well, for you and I, the analogy is here's your axe. Here's your tool. If you're going to cut down trees and build a new house for your spiritual development, then you have to know how to use your axe. You have to know how to lay your hand to it. You have to know how to apply it. And this, again, is where we run into trouble because a lot of people don't want to pick it up. If I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you, please don't raise hands, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but how many of you honestly have read it cover to cover just one time and think you deserve a great big blue ribbon? And that was 14 years ago. How many of you are dedicated to reading through this book once a year? Once every two years would be fine. I don't think there's magic in one year. But you want to know it so bad you're going to read the book almost every day unless you're in ICU or on your back at home with the flu and can't hardly open your eyes. Otherwise, somewhere, somewhere in the day, you're doing your Bible reading. That's learning how to handle your sword, your axe. Well, most folks don't want to do it. Not anyone sharpen their skills on it. Some folks don't even know where their axe is. And others don't know how to use it because they haven't picked it up. One guy said it's like, you know, you're out there in the woods and somebody's got his hands on the axe handle and he's just pounding away on the tree. Problem is, there's no axe head on the handle. He's going through all the motions, but he's not getting anywhere because he doesn't know what his equipment is and he or she doesn't know how to use it. Let me clear that analogy up just a little bit. Showing up at Sunday morning... That's going through the motion, right? And that's good motion, not arguing against it. Singing, having the Lord's Supper and putting the contribution in, sincerely praying along with prayer time, really listening, that, that's good stuff. But if that's all you do is just that short time you're here at the building Sunday morning, then literally you're the guy out there swinging the axe handle without anything on the end of it, trying to cut down a tree to build a spiritual house, but you don't have your equipment doing what it really ought to be doing. Unless you really, really get intense with it, then you're just going to go through the motions. 
Now, you're going to be better than probably 80% of people in America doing just that. But you are never going to cause God in heaven to say something like you said about Job. That's my Job. Have you looked at him? You're never going to bring a smile to your father's face if that's all there is to your Christianity. Now, let me be clear. All those things I mentioned are good. And they are a step in the right direction. And for a new convert, that may be a very good place to stand for a little while. But there comes a time to take that step. And there comes a time to take that step. And to keep taking those steps. And keep growing and growing and growing. Until somebody is looking at you going, I'm having trouble with this passage. Could you help me with it? Or I need to talk to somebody and I think you're somebody I can lean on. Or we need somebody to do a devotional or teach the class or fill the pulpit because our preacher's not here today. We think you're the man for it. That takes working and knowing your equipment. You have to know it. And if you know it, then you can do something pretty awesome. So, do you know your axe? So they're out there cutting down wood and we have a problem. The axe head flies off and it lands in the water. And the gentleman, the prophet there is, can I use a modern term? He's kind of freaked out because it was borrowed. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick, threw it in there and made the iron float. And there he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. That's a little weird. When I was a kid, I made a straight pin float using the tension of the water. And it was a little science experiment and worried the teacher to death because I had a full cup of water on her desk can't remember how that worked out to come to think of it. That was about the fifth grade. But making an axe head float, I just think, wow, that's awesome. That's pretty amazing. But there's some stuff going on here. So I look at my Bible program. I use eSword on my desktop, and it is F-R-E-E, -E, absolutely free. has more resources that download for free, and I'm always trying to sell you a little extra. But it has more resources that come with it for free than I'll ever be able to use in the rest of my lifetime, I know. And on it, I have 35 Bible translations. So I always get to click compare, and it takes all 35 translations, puts them on one screen, and shows you all the different ways it's done. Even in the Greek and the Hebrew, that don't mean a thing to me. But it's all there, right? So I'm looking at that, and I noticed that other translations, I already knew this, said he made the axe head swim. I thought, hmm. If you're using like the ASV, uh, you'll have the word swim or swam there instead of float. And I got to counting them. And I went through again today just to be sure. Because, you know, sometimes we preachers make mistakes. And so out of the 35 translations that I have on my computer program, 15 of those use the word, a form of the word swim. I like that better. Now I use the New King James. Remember I told you just because it was a gift back when I was in my 20s, I got used to it. And well, there you have it. I'm not a big advocate. I'm not against it. But you have swim. And the reason I like swim better than float is because as a preacher, I can do something with that. Because if I got somebody just floating along, that's not necessarily good. Back in my younger days, I worked for a funeral home when I was about 21 to 27, and we referred to certain corpses as floaters. That was not a good thing. You know, you don't want to be a floater if they have that kind of terminology in your head. You may have a little happier terminology in your head. There have been days where we took the grandkids to the water park and they have the lazy river, and you get in the inner tube, and what do you do? You float. You don't do nothing. Where do you go? You go where the current takes you. That's, all, that's your only choice. So just floating suggests to me a, a passiveness. Just floating suggests to me, you know, like, yeah, I'm just kind of here. You know, current takes me this way. I'll go this way. Maybe the wind will blow me this way a little bit. I'll go, the, you know, but there's, there's no direction. Now, can you swim that way? Swimming, you've got to have some direction, right? You've got to kind of know where you're going and, and have some purpose and intent. And you can swim across the current, with the current, against the current. That's all pretty cool. I like that. So I like the idea better that Elisha came along and he made the axe head swim. And then we're going to ask, well, where did it swim to? Well, the text does not directly say, but I think it implies, maybe not a strict necessary implication, but it implies that it swam to the prophet that had lost it. Because when it came up, floated, swam, Elijah didn't say, there it is, go get it before it swims away. Go chase after it. Go, go, go. Come on, go get it before it drifts off down with the current. What did Elisha say? You're looking at your book? Pick it up. Where do you think it was then? He didn't say wait out in the water 20 yards and get it. He said, pick it up. 
Now, I don't know if he had to take a step or two, but he didn't have to swim out. He didn't have to get a boat. It sounds to me like he just reached down and picked it up. Now, that's awesome too, isn't it? Because now let's go back to James 4, 8 for just a second. God desires to draw near to you, but God will not force himself on you. Back in 9 11, remember that? Some, of course, weren't even born then, but um, people would say, Where was God? Where was your God at when those planes crashed into the Twin Towers? If you believe in all that stuff. And somebody had the excellent response He was just where you asked Him to be. You said, Get out, God. And God's a gentleman. And He said, I'll leave you on your own if that's what you want. That's a little sobering, isn't it? God will step out of your life until the judgment day, and let you make your own choices, your own decision, and go any direction you choose to go until that appointed judgment day that you must keep. And then he'll do what God does. And so people make all kinds of crazy decisions. The Word of God, <clears throat> to, to hold the analogy together with the swimming axe head, is trying to come to you. It is trying to be there on the surface where you can get it. But if you won't reach down and pick it up, God is not going to jump up out of the water and force Himself into your heart and your mind. It's a two-way street. God desires to draw near to you. You draw near to God. The two of you do that together, and then you start to get what's going on. One other thing that we'll close. I think the reason people don't is that they're looking for magic. They're looking for something. You mean, wait a minute, preacher. i got to present my body a living sacrifice? i got to pick up my cross and follow Him? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. And you're going to get to that point where you have the attitude like Paul, where he said all of the stuff that he had, he counted. I love the old King James. He counted it as dung. Do I need to elaborate? Modern words manure, right? He looked at all of the stuff the world clamors for and says, it's nothing but stuff you ought to shovel out of the stall and put in the garden for best use. That's all it is. Yes, that's what God is saying. But people are hurting and they're hurting everywhere. And so they're running looking for answers. But they don't want a hard answer. They want a quick answer. It's like people going to the doctor. Doc, just give me a pill. I don't want to change the way I eat. I don't want to change my exercise. I don't want to change. Just give me a pill. Let me keep doing what I'm doing. I got one thing to say. And I'm going to try to bring it to a close. You're going to hurt. One way or the other. Life hurts. Life is hard. And whether you try to walk life with a bottle, you're going to hurt. You can try to walk life with weed, you're going to hurt. Or you can try to walk life with God and a church family like this one, and you're still going to hurt. That's why I said weep with those who weep. When we're on the spiritual journey, we hurt. When we're on the broad path, we hurt. There's not a system out there anywhere that you can become a part of and you'll never have any more pain, struggling, or suffering in your life. It will all magically go away. It doesn't exist. You're going to hurt in life. Now the question is, do you want to hurt while you're building your spiritual life like the prophets of old and deal with those struggles? Or do you want to hurt with a guy who's drowning in the bottom of the bottle, bottom of the bottle, having drug and alcohol problems, his marriage is falling apart and he can't keep a job? Choose how you want to hurt, but you're going to hurt. That's this life. I've been on both sides of the tracks. No stories to tell right now. Running out of time. I've seen the other side up close and so ugly. Looking back, it scares me sometimes. But when you're 16 and dumb, you don't realize where you're at. And then I've been on the good side of the tracks for a long time. And it hurts. And I will take the hurting on the good side of the tracks any day over the hurting that happens in the middle of a government project. Housing project. You know what I mean? That ought to be enough said. If you're going to build that new life, if you're going to build that spirituality and really learn how to live in the bullseye of your purpose, then you're going to sink her in with God. And you're going to let Him brush away your tears instead of let Him fall in your beer. Right? So, it takes action. It takes work. It takes effort. The Word of God is a gold mine. It's just that you have to slow down. You have to slow way down. And you've got to read it and you've got to think about it. Uh, and you've you got to take a passage sometimes and just run a copy of it off on the copy or something. So I've got to carry that with me a while. I haven't figured that one out yet. But if you'll stay with it, stay with it, you'll start seeing. And you'll say, oh, wow. And it's awesome. 
and then you act on it. One last statement, I'm done. The aim of Bible reading is not knowledge. And the aim of knowledge, education, is not knowledge. It's all aiming at action. Now you need the right knowledge to build that action on. But what's what we're looking for in the end? God is not looking for somebody that can quote Bible verses and tell you what the right doctrines are. God is looking for somebody who lives it. Action. And so I ask, are you taking the action God wants you to take in your life? If you are, stay the course. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. I don't know if you're elementary school, junior high, maybe you're in high school, maybe you're all the way to college spiritual level. I don't know where you are, but you stay the course because you'll make the graduations as they come along. But if you know you're not, it's time to get serious and make a change. This isn't just a game. If it's private, I always say make it private. If it's public and we can help you in any public way, let us know while together we stand and sing.